This episode of this episode of Capes and Lunatic Sidekicks is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is DG Chichester, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. Wow, I've never sounded better. <laughs> <laughs> For some magic, yes. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Devil You Know, the, Dare- the Daredevil Podcast, that's right, and we promised and we promised, and it's finally here, we got our friend Mr. DG Chichester back to talk uh, Daredevil 317, 318, hello. Hello gonna- everybody. I'm just going to call you Dan because I'm going to stumble over that DG. I, I would, I would, I would advise I would stumble over that. My wife nicknamed for me for the longest time Deej, but that was, you know, but then she gave up on that after a while. That was the easier way to do it. No. All right. So again, we threw out quite like if anyone had any questions for you. The one question I got, somebody texted the email number, which is new for me. Um. And I'm just like, you know, we have these issues, and the one question we got her is, what does the G stand for in DG Chichester? Oh, wow, that was the best question. Um, you know, when I was really arrogant and young, it used to be God. I mean, I would go with that a lot. But, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, and then, it, and then it was guest, you know, for a long time, uh, just to, you know, keep screening with it. But it's it's George. It's my 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 father's name was the same, you know, so. Daniel George Chichester, and then it just uh, naturally went to me. So um, it became very pretentious when you just collapse the name and just go with the initial. Another internet mystery solved. <laughs> exactly. You're just I'm just revealing my inner secret. You guys, you know, very important secrets. But yeah, I mean, yeah. So. The, the reason we're here is to cover Daredevil 317 and 318, cover date June and July 1993. And I think the most important question is... Good God. Yes. I, I mean, it's, it's basically... Well, well what, some big questions. One, why Greece? Why are these... It's like a, a collaboration of criminals just after Greece. Why the Greece? Just like the, the, the overarching question with these two issues is why, right? You know, why did you do this story? Um, so this actually kind of goes back to, uh, in some ways, the, the pitch that, you know, I won Daredevil with, you know, was talking about making Daredevil, uh, making New York City a character in the book. And one of the things that, you know, allowed me to make New York City, I think, a character in the book to some degree was a newspaper that's no longer around, which is called New York News. And so of the many New York papers that there were at the time, and now it's down to what, you know, maybe two or three, there's now the Times, the High End, and the New York Post, the Daily News still around. We don't talk about the Post. We don't talk about the Post. The, the, the paper that shall not be named. And... Uh, those are more tabloids. The New York Times, you know, is, is you know, it's whatever high literacy, you know, uh, journalism. Newsday was somewhere in the middle. Newsday was kind of, you know, book themselves as like the everyday paper of of New York, and uh, they had different sections within the paper that actually hit upon every neighborhood in New York. So there was within when you picked up the the daily paper. There was certainly a lot that went to Manhattan, but there was the Queens section, there's the Brooklyn section, there's the Bronx section, there's the Staten Island section. And these really got in, and they had amazing writers, they had great, great writers uh, and very uh, literate, interesting writers with a lot of personality and voice. And so they would pick up on these, these individual stories. And in fact, my biggest fear uh, for writing men without fear was when I moved out of the city at a certain point, and I was like, how am I going to keep up <laughs> with these stories from Newsday, which are giving me so much inspiration? And I actually ended up uh, finding a way to get them to deliver the paper to me outside the city, which probably cost me more than I was being paid to write the book. But uh, I liked mainlining these stories. And one of these stories is I would keep a clip file. You know, I would read this and I'd read about this 
DA who, uh, you know, busted this, uh, this drug market. And that would become DA Kathy Malper, who later became sort of like a semi-regular, you know, character that I would do. But she was based upon an actual FBI RICO, um, you know, story. And in fact, at one point, I got a call from the FBI saying, what are you doing using our, our DA in the story? And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> but, but one of these odd little side stories was back at Greece, restaurant Greece was a, a commodity item on the criminal market, uh, which was the most bizarre, strange thing to me that of all the things you could steal uh, and actually profit from was that some restaurants were having their uh, whatever grease bit out back ripped off. And I, I clipped this and I put a file and, and, you know, I percolated it around and said, what can you do with a story like this? Is this going to become just a bit? And then um, as we were playing things out, it suddenly said, you know what, this become like an entire ridiculous story. And um, and then uh, and so that's where the grease angle itself uh, came from. So it wasn't make believe. Maybe it's it, but it was a very strange decision to make it make it into a full blown two issue story. Well, was it one of the other reasons you decided to do this story? Because, I mean, it was very entertaining. Again, it it fit in with your style of writing, but also it was kind of – some of it was on the silly side. Was, oh, absolutely. Was part of the reason that was placed here is because it comes right before Fall from Grace. So you're like, okay, before we get really dark, let's do something a little more lighthearted. Yes, definitely. I, I mean, it was it was um, of all the places it could possibly fit, and that even gets acknowledged. I think on the on the cover, right? I think Pat wrote the, uh, um, you know, something. This is folks, the last issue of Daredevil before you know. Yeah, there you go. Before three nineteen, right? Um, I think that was Pat Gary, you know, who, who copped you know to to that. Um, and certainly, we knew where Fall from Grace was going to go um, completely. You know, that was well plotted out and well tracked you know from beginning to end and all the things that were going to happen there uh and this story would never have existed in this way afterwards especially because of some of his relationships or at least acknowledgements of of uh, uh, some of the characters you know besides the taskmaster and and stilt man those kind of things the, the daredevil having to appear to be a new daredevil afterwards you know would not have tracked as well with those kind of uh, little comparisons but yeah Phil, i mean absolutely it's a it's if, if no one acknowledged that this is a silly story and i think some people didn't i mean i think this has probably got some, um maybe most irate letters uh you know we ever got or maybe i ever got in the sense of how dare you uh <laughs> no pun intended you know uh, have fun with daredevil how dare you uh, laugh at the streets or those kind of things and uh but it's these, these kind of real things that happen and it was so ridiculous it felt like it could work and i think for the most part it, it did i mean i've reread it you know before you know we got on um over the last couple of days just to make sure i knew what i was talking about and uh there are some really uh, you know silly but actually fun bits that i think work I mean, and I had the original pizza rat. I think. <laughs> oh, we'll get that. Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I like what I mean. There, there are some good dark Daredevil stories, but I mean, that's the thing with Daredevil—he can go dark, but then he also has like a sense of humor. I mean, even in this, in these two, in this two-parter, I mean, he probably could have taken these guys down a lot sooner, but he's like, oh, let me let these guys, let me run these guys through the maze, you know, let them let them get to their goal, and then you know, then we'll just kind of take them down, even though. You know, it's kind of a, even he's right. just, look at this mess. It, it's not an end of the world story, right? There, there's no there's no dramatic uh, turn of, um, of events that are going to uh, undo all of New York City or all of America or all of the world if if they got their hands on on the stuff and walked away from it. It, it. I laugh reading it now too. Like I guess half a million dollars seemed like such an extraordinary amount of money at the time. Uh, whereas now it's sort of like a rounding error on the, on the stock market. But uh, at that time, I guess it seemed, wow, they got their hands on half a million dollars. Uh, that would be a big deal. Um, uh, 
and so even if they had gotten it and any one of them would profit from that, um, I don't think it would affect the criminal enterprise of New York, but um, uh, it was it was fun to play with those guys and, and sort of uh, have them like compete off each other. And, and clearly, or maybe not so clearly, I don't know, it depends on your, your movie knowledge. I mean, uh, it is it is very much an homage to the, the film. It's a bad, 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 bad world. So if you know that film at all, um, that's, there, you know, there are direct intentional parallels uh, to play that out. So there's no way it's not intended as a comedy. <laughs> I mean, I miss these kind of stories because that's what we're always saying. It's like it, every story doesn't have to be the end of the world or even like, oh, the whole city's going to go down. I miss like, you know, stopping bank robberies or just like heists, that, you know, simple yeah. little things. Yeah. I, I mean, I hope, you know, we're going to do this monthly now, right? Which I'm very yeah. honored to, to do this with you guys. Thank you for, you know, for that. And, uh, but, um, you know, so we're not, I don't want to go off on a detour and something we're going to talk about later, but one of my favorite issues is, is 34 hours, which is oh, yeah. just a, a story that is completely a series of incidents that are, you know, just moments in time that Dale happens to be there. And and I think that's one of the, in my mind, one of the best applications of, of Daredevil and, and, um, and, uh, and it doesn't have to be about the end of the world. It could have been the end of the world for one of those people in the moment, right? There were some individual things that would have happened, but the city would have kept on. But that's the fun of it. Lil, if you have any questions, I feel like I'm hogging. Uh, no, 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 go ahead. I just, I enjoyed the comedy aspect of it very much because, you know, you know, every he, he's in between his mental breakdown. So, yes, let's be happy. Let's have something silly. <laughs> it's just very, um, I think writers don't give uh, readers, modern comics can never, in other words, that breathing room, the palate cleanser mm -hmm. a lot. And, like, it's, like, the one shots are, like, just wrapping things up and then, like, setting it up. But, no, this is, like, genuinely... A palate cleanser because what comes next oh boy yeah they're not, so they're not really... underappreciated in modern, modern <laughs> there's there's not a lot of light moments in call from grace i guess um there's um i don't know how much is driven by so it, you know it's, a, it's an interesting observation but i don't know how much is driven especially in the in the big publisher you know world um by editorial direction you know, is it is it every has to be, you know, at this at this level of of it and you and you never have these moments in between? I don't know. Um, you know, we had a lot of um, uh, we had a lot of leeway. Right. We had a great ed editorial team and they were very open to what about this and what about that? And, and, and in terms of steering Daredevil and the character, I felt like we had we as the creative team and we as the at Daredevil office, for the most part, had a lot of opportunity to, yeah, try that out, go go play with that. So um, it was it was that, that's that's a gift you recognize now more after the fact than maybe in the moment of actually doing. It. I mean, yeah, this kind of story. I mean, there are certain characters you couldn't do this with, but like Daredevil or even a Spider Man. I mean, that you shouldn't yeah. break. I mean, yeah, they can do like different stories like this with ca certain characters. You know, street level kind of have a sense of humor. Deadpool. Deadpool. Oh, Deadpool. That's what, like like reading it. I was just like, this this could be a Deadpool story. <laughs> we ended a little differently, but sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and you know, you can you can when you understand the character, and I think you you appreciate the character, you can do almost anything with it. I mean, think about the the Walt Simonson's. You know, turning Thor into a frog story. Uh, that there's nothing probably more bizarre in the history of a serious character. You know, a, a, an epic, galactic level, uh, you know, hero than turning him into a frog in Central Park. And there is, you know, we can talk about that too. But and I'm pretty sure. I mean, I wasn't close to Walt or the Thor office or whatever. But if I remember the um, the uh, 
the chatter at the time. Um, I think there was probably some editorial, not resistance to that, not in the Thor office itself, but maybe even higher up. I'm like, you're doing what to Thor? And <laughs> and yet it's one of the most bizarre, memorable stories with moments of adventure and, and real comedy. How else? You got you a gotta frog with a hammer. <laughs> oh, yeah. They still reference that to this day. Yeah. 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 But no, I mean, just, just let you, I like this story because it's like, it's a fun story and you can even tell it's like, even like your main characters having fun, like, you know, Daredevil's having fun with this, even like when Matt, yeah, just dancing around these guys, even when he's talking to Ben Urich, you know, he's like, okay, I got to get, get going. He starts changing and Ben's like, should I turn around? He's like, I don't know if you want to not develop an inferiority complex. You know? Exactly. <laughs> no, that's, that's like good, you know, or, or I, I love the bit it's where Murdoch. he's It's Matt Murdock, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he got the ease of them, yeah, sort of knowing what's going on. But I, I love the scene where he's, you know, he's behind the wall listening in on them where they're trying to rip apart, the, you know, flip Jimmy's apartment, you know, looking for the for the clues, and and they're they're so dense and dull they're not finding it. And he just like bangs on the wall so the the picture falls and they and they get it. You know, he's leading them on and and inevitably knowing that they're going to end up in covered in grease but he's he's also being heroic enough the air quotes for just people who are listening um you know that that uh he's going to try to give them an out and he keeps trying to give them an out so just step away from this this is not going to go well for you you know not in the usual um uh sense of oh you're going to end up behind bars or whatever <laughs> but you're going to end up covered in 20 year old grease or whatever that would be um and yeah exactly it's not a it's not a a, a tale for uh, right before lunchtime. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think he even makes the comment at one point: the blind leading the blind, which it, you know. Yeah, exactly. I no, no, no. My my favorite panel for three seventeen is where he's just sitting at the desk. He's like, "Grease, you can't make this stuff up." And I was like, "Is that meta? Was that meta?" It is because it's like that's, but that's it. That goes back to that clip file I was talking about, right? It's sort of like you clip the story, and it's like. Is this a real story in the first place? And then you have it you're in your idea file, and you're and you're saying, do you can you do something with it? And then you do something with it, and you say they're going to actually let me publish this. Um, and uh, and even I think it's I think it's the opening to the to the second part where he's it's the big splash and or semi splash, and he's surrounded by everybody, and he's he's kind of like, why is this happening to me? And and it's it's. Which is again an acknowledgement that this is a character who's usually in the middle of some dark alley confrontation, and and here's a moment where we can have some, you know, some some fun. I mean, there's always places you go back and you look at these things and you reread them and you say, ah, I could have improved on that, or that would have been better if this was, or there was a lost joke, or there was a joke that didn't work, or that kind of thing. Comedy's hard. I mean, it's it's. And I'm not going to pretend to be, you know, a master of it, but. Um, but there are again moments that work, and moments that eh, a bunch of years later I could have could have done it better. But uh, overall, it's got some it's got some good chuckles, especially if you know the world and know the and know some of these characters. Did your did your artist go? What are you thinking, man? <laughs> did, you have fun? did he loosen up and have fun with it as well? I, I think Scott had notes. I, I think Scott had fun. I mean, I think the expressions. And, and, you know, we always talk about the stories. Uh, you know, we get a lot of daily, every other day communication about things, you know, on the phone, back and forth. And um, and I think I think the energy of things that he was doing and, the and you know, obviously he was going to shift his style radically, you know, in, in, uh, in, in just one issue um, and, and come back with what he would continue to build on. But uh, I, I think there's a lot of, of just vibrancy and lunacy and, and, and good times with the way that they look, you know, the way the cars are careening around the corners, uh, the way Stiltman's armor is uh, it continuously sort of malfunctioning and, and you know, pulling him here or jerking him there or his expression when roaches come charging up from the inside. <laughs> it's just a bunch of, you know, pure... Pure goop. So I think I think Scott was that ball. It looks looks like it to me. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a credit to Scott. Yeah, he didn't change up his style, and it's like even Stiltman looks. You know, 
you know, well, somewhat menacing until you see all those cockroaches in his armor. But yeah. exactly, exactly. He's like, I've got this technology, and I'm towering over you all, and and they're all just so full of themselves. That was the other, you know, moment, you know, for me, reminding myself, rereading it, and sort of seeing it. That was, you know, when you've got these characters who are think they own the world. You know, I'm Taskmaster. You know, I I do this. You know, I'm you know the wild boys acting like they're you know, kings of the streets and every one of them gets taken down by, um, you know, their own pride in, in so many ways and their and their greed, um, which is as much playing with the character as, again, that homage to that film where, you know, where so many characters just end up uh, in comedy and tragedy uh, because they, they let themselves get carried away by this enormous reward of money speaking I'm, of villains are you able sorry to cut you off though are but, you able to just use whatever villain or just editorial come in ah, ah, ah. <laughs> um well back 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 in the day Lilith, uh if you and so i'm not sure what they, they do now but back in the day if you owned the villain or the character you in other words like it was it was directly aligned with um uh with the title it was a daredevil villain right or it was a character that ended up sort of operating within the daredevil universe like ben Yurin, right or something like that um then you never needed permission you know you could do whatever you wanted if you wanted to borrow a character if i wanted to when we used spider-man right when, you know, for example I had to go to danny finger off and say danny we want to use spider-man and here's how we want to use him. so danny had to give permission for us to do it um and the same thing with a a villain who might be part of the rogues gallery of another character. We would ask permission, and for the most part, <clears throat> unless there was a plan, no, no, we're going to kill so and so off, or so and so is going to be involved in a five issue story at that exact same time. He can't be in two places at once, as if that logic. Because Kingpin made. just comes yeah. to mind with you know Spider Man and Daredevil specifically, so. Well, at some like, point, are they not you know, using King, Kingpin because Spider Man's busy with them, so that makes sense. Well, you know, at some point, um, uh, probably during, I would imagine, you know, like Miller's run, um, I don't know if it was a conscious decision or not. That was before, you know, I really got involved, but uh, I, you know, Kingpin, I think, became much more a Daredevil villain, and he became a. a a spider-man rightly so <laughs> right so so by so at that point kingpin was owned by the daredevil office and people wanted to use kingpin even spider-man um had to come to us to sort of say we want to do this with kingpin so when we took kingpin down and and part of the conscious keep kingpin out of the spotlight have him kind of come back from the street level there were some people who were unhappy with that because they want to use Kingpin and they want to use Kingpin exactly the way that he always has been used. Like we had people coming to us at one point, I think saying, Oh, we're going to use Kingpin. He's going to be on top of the world. He's going to be running his roost from, you know, the top of the skyscrapers. Like, well, we just spent six, seven issues taking him down and now he's, he's ruined and you can't do that. And <laughs> so sometimes there was that disconnect. Cause he, yeah, uh, no, Lilith, I was just going to ask, um, so what, what was behind the, did you just want a big cast of villains, or was, was there a specific uh, motive behind which villains you, like, like you had used Taskmaster before, and, and Pete London was your guy, but it's like, why Stiltman, why some of the other, Wild Boys, yeah, was it just, well, did you Wild just, Boys, um, did you just want some really characters, or was there a specific, uh, um, I think it was things that felt like they could be. I mean, Wild Boys was. I cannot remember exactly, but I would I would put good money down um, on the fact that I was just lifting a couple of outrageous characters that my friend Greg Wright played with a lot. So I wouldn't. I I knew I needed ridiculous characters. I knew I needed, you know, people who could be over the top. So they were over the top characters. Um, and a lot of times, Greg and I would trade ideas and trade characters because uh, we were you know, friends and colleagues. So I would, I would put money on, that was an easy lift. The other ones were either, you know, hardcore Daredevil villain, hardcore, meaning they were part of the rogues gallery, like Stiltman. And, uh, um, and I, I know that I was, I was looking for um, uh, characters that could be full of themselves. 
as, as I said before, you know, somebody who would take a lot of pride in in being the preacher of, you know, tattered Damalian or, or, you know, the, the nobody outdoes me of Taskmaster or the technology supreme of Stiltman, because then you could turn the dial up on that just a little bit more and they would be, you know, easy to, to, to play with, you know, and yet, you know, and that they were also all, for the most part, you know, thieves or anti-thieves, you know, in the, in the Tatter Damalian, you know, um, aspect, where they would, um, you know, Taskmaster's a profiteer, right? Stiltman is a profiteer. So it would make sense for um, them to go after a cash bonus as opposed to suddenly, hey, can I borrow Thanos for this? And and that would have been, you know, <laughs> which would have been an interesting story, but it would have been much weird you know weirder to sort of really suddenly have this galactic or um interdimensional villain playing in a profit way like he could have showed up in his helicopter exactly yeah. <laughs> but no i mean I, I i think it worked great i i thought the mix of actual super villains and street level gangsters i mean that could really go off the rails and i thought you handled it really well it's just like oh yeah i mean this mix of guys i could see them looking for their payday and Right, right. I just, you know, if I was, to, again, half a million dollars seems like nothing today, you know, which is terrible. It's inflation. It's inflation, <laughs> exactly, right? It's like you read it now and you're still like, half a million dollars, who There's cares? The little you know? note, for sliding time scale for t- in today's money, that would be. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like, it's like when you watch films today and they put that disclaimer in front of it. This film represents, you know, social mores and conventions that were okay at the time. You know, you just put a new disclaimer at the front of this one. This represents real money in 1993. <laughs> I love the cover of 18. Oh, 318. Just mwah, oh, he's like, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, it's like, I think I gotta, I have to imagine that's all Pat because I didn't, I didn't, you know, this, this was, this was a, I had seen the cover sketch, but I hadn't seen it all with, with, um, you know, with the dialogue, so I think this is all Pat at that point, um, and that's a great, uh, you know, a great, great uh, a lot of fun is having. Kind of gives away the ending, but it's fun. But you just sort of knew where it was going to go anyway. Yeah, like these seem like great fun issues. I can only imagine the conversations you and your artist had back and forth. <laughs> it's like, are yeah. you okay, I mean, it's like, What are you? <laughs> It, it, once you got past the are you serious thing from a creation point of view, like you know, once you put that story out on the table and you explain to Ralph and Pat and Scott, you know, no, this is a real thing. And, and then everybody starts to go, wow, weird. What do you, you know, then, then, then they're right into it and then they, they end up playing it out. Um, and once you're kind of all in, then you, you sort of let yourself run with it. Oh, hey, Lil, Russell is up. Was there a specific reason you chose Tattered Amalian? I be, I thought you said, yeah, it wasn't it because he was like the anti, you know, forsake, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah. He, he was, that's a good question. But yeah, he was, Tattered Amalian was so committed to that, that you know, anti um, material possession, you know, aspect. He could be and was a great counter to the rest of them. I didn't need one more person who was greedy. We had a bunch of people who were clearly greedy and, I want that money. I want that profit. Um, but have him be as intentional to go after it to stop the others from getting it, um, you know, became a great um, uh, uh, sort of conflict, you know, to to, uh, to where the rest of them were going. And I guess in some ways, you know, going back to that, that homage, you know, he becomes, uh, he's a bit of a wild card character quite like that and it's a mad 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 world um but he uh but he, he complicates it you know by by being yeah because it's almost it's almost like a little break for daredevil you know with this big storyline because like lilith was talking about a palate cleanser i mean it's this story is like almost more you'd have to say this group of villains drives the story more than daredevil daredevil is just more almost no oh. Spectator, but I mean, just yeah, this is like the villain driven story, yeah. And he gets to, he gets to sort of like you know, you know, uh, push them 
along and and stop them from murdering each other or murdering other people or getting other people letting a lot of the people die because of their their thing like when the the, the not the sushi chef the um uh, the hibachi chef you know comes charging out you know to to try to get revenge on taskmaster for ruining his restaurant you know if they're going to take him out of the way or or whatever the guy would have probably been killed right even, even though just because Taskmaster's not a nice guy. But, okay, so he saves that guy from his own bad decisions. Or he saves even the villains from killing each other, because Daredevil doesn't necessarily want un, undue death even amongst these people. It's not the character. Or the character. If any of his villains are going to die, he's going to be the reason for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So... But but yeah, it's 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 definitely a story where I'm sure Daredevil would be very happy for none of this to ever have happened, and never have it fallen on his <laughs> his his radar figuratively and, and from a, a hyper sense point of view. But because it did, he had to he had to follow it through to its uh, uh, miserable greasy end. And I love the puns. I don't know if you're responsible for the puns, uh, for the, like the wordplay of the covers and stuff. Like you know, grease is the word, and you know, grease monkey. Oh, the ti- the title, the titles definitely. Yeah, I was, I was. Uh, you, you, you're in high pun mode, and you're in high fun mode to, when you're playing again with a story uh, like this. If you're not trying to <laughs> take advantage of the situation from a writing point of view, you're you shouldn't be telling this story. So I mean, I mean, we it came at it from a reader's perspective. Was this like a palate cleanser for you too? Because you're like, okay, I know I'm gonna have to start writing some dark stuff coming up. So here, let me let me write something that tickles my funny bone. You know, maybe Scott's and no doubt. I, I think you guys have, have really nailed it with this palate cleanser you know, sort of feeling. I mean, I didn't I didn't feel that we needed needed that so much to sort of oh, I gotta I gotta shake all this off before we we get to. Um, before we get to fall from grace, because a lot of things were happening concurrently, or, you know, certainly a lot of, well, the, well, the issues had to be written uh, linearly, you know, I had to write 317 and 318 before I got to writing 319 and, and such. There was a lot of stuff happening in terms of, here's the proposal for fall from grace. Here's what we're going to do with these issues. We're going to get to 325, which feels like it's a nominal, type of milestone issues so you know we're mapping that out so a lot of that was being mapped out concurrently with writing the actual issues so it wasn't necessarily like I need to wash my hands of of everything before I start in on on 319 but um but it's it's also trying to explore different things and and not getting caught in in a in a all daredevil can be or these types of story Sometimes you, you take directions and they don't work, right, as, as much. And you say, I'm going to Daredevil in this situation, and and maybe it doesn't play out as well from a character or incident point of point of view, but you shake it up. You know, why did we send him to Vegas? Because we want in another issue, because we want to play with some different senses and different and different situations and also set him up for a crossover storyline. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but you... Uh, you know, you play different ways, and I hadn't done a a comedic Daredevil story. You know, when I jumped into the to, to taking on the title, it was you know it was high hand action and and, uh, and you know, dark Ghost Rider incidents. And hey, here's the Punisher. So we were uh, we had fun with it, but it wasn't they weren't fun storylines. I mean, I have so many different eras of Daredevil I love, and I, you know, there's so many stories I love, but a lot of writers seem to stick in the same, like... Torture the poor boy till he can't, till he snaps. Some of yeah. them loses his mind. But even some of them who don't, it's just like, everyone seems to, like, write in the same flavor of Daredevil. I mean, this man here, like, seemed to jump all over the place, and I, enjoy, I enjoyed it then, I enjoy it now. I'm like, yeah, I mean, you have him in Vegas. I mean, we got to cover Dead Man's Hand one day. I mean, Lil's favorite city, Las Vegas. I mean, yeah, you have that. You have, yeah, like you said, you had an issue with Ghost Rider, and then we had this two-parter. It's like the, you know, 
you see, you seem to mix it up every couple uh, arcs, and I really appreciated it. Probably just for his sanity, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's great to hear, guys. I mean, uh, and I appreciate that that observation, and, and that wasn't sort of, um, uh, you know, um, just oh, Dan wants to play in different genres, so he's going to use Daredevil as a way to sort of force himself into it. I hope not. Um, but it, it again goes back to uh, mainlining that idea of the city, because even when he was in Vegas, he was the aspect of him as a New Yorker, a New Yorker. You can hear my accent coming out there. Uh, that uh, <laughs> that is um, uh, that is about what you're playing. With. And I was looked at Daredevil as wanting to play more city than just Hell's Kitchen. And, and while Hell's Kitchen was a big deal, there were there were so many parts of New York. And I completely, again, admit that that was me uh, enriching myself so much with that newspaper uh, because I found it such an inspiration and such a variety of things across the city to, um, to be inspired by this is happening with this new building or this is happening with this part of town or, or You know, these are happening here. And I never knew where these things were going. I would just clip these things out, physically clip these things out, right? This <laughs> is the old days. And just put them in a file. And then now and again, um, when I needed the inspiration, go back through and suddenly what had been percolating in my head would become the story. And there's so many aspects of just you know, all from grace, even though that was, you know, the, the, the whole thing about his new costume how it was made, the pieces of it there, all were things from clip files that would then become the actual physical construction of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, like I was saying, I, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, there were certain stories, especially back in the 90s, like you could tell, like you kind of knew which direction people were going in, but like I would stumble across this. I was like, oh, I, I didn't see this coming, and this is really, you know, really happy i didn't see this come in or even you know like you were talking about 34 hours that story i'm like you know this is really good i'm like no one else is really doing this you know even like a spider-man or somebody yeah i mean this is you really, know why? really good. good writers give you stuff you never even thought you wanted and then exactly. once you get it you're like you. i need more and they're like nope on to the next thing sorry <laughs> <laughs> exactly thank you for putting my words yeah. into something that makes <laughs> No, that's uh, that's that's uh, that's really nice to hear. Thank you. Uh, oh, Russell's asking about Mister Fear and stuff, but uh, Chet, uh, Russell, we're gonna get the, the this stuff because we're gonna be talking to Mister Chichester every month. So I don't want to like spoil things that are to come. So yeah, because yeah, I haven't done I haven't done much talk in Mister Fear research yet. I gotta go back in and be properly. You know, primed. Um, anything about Greece, heat London, you know, fa you know, fatty foods, you know, rats in the park. Um, I'm definitely like, uh, you know, up on right now. But if you start talking to me about the fear storyline, I'd have to go back in. Except that one, I think there's a one panel in here. There's like a name check back to that. But. Yeah, we'll give you like a month to get get up the speed. Up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I got to dig the issues out. I got to reread them. Remind myself, like, wait a minute. Is that? Who's that character? Somebody sent me one thing one time. Uh, um, I guess they were putting wasn't from Marvel, but somebody was putting together a, a some kind of it was a question of the Shield storyline. It was like I'm, so, I'm sorry, I just don't even remember the character <laughs> like at all. I have to go back in and and, and dig it up. But you know, I felt bad because clearly it was important. To them, but I, I just didn't have that at the top of my head. Mm. Uh, obviously, there's some things that are just like seared in your brain about you know certain stories, right? It's just the oh yeah, absolutely. Just like the in between stories. Some, some things you remember literally like they were yesterday, you know, to, to coin the phrase. But um, some things you need to be reminded of and why. But then when you go back into it, it's like a little bit of a time capsule to sort of like understand where 
you know, where you were in your head, where those things kind of came from, uh, you know, why, you know, why was this character, um, you know, Pete London, I remember completely because it created him for a certain reason and he was based on a certain thing and, but his henchmen in this story, I don't remember as well. You know, I don't remember, I don't remember why Hacker was such a, uh, um, germaphobe, you know, or, or. Because Greece is remember. disgusting. If yeah, you've well, no, but, but he's fast food. And you've seen that exactly. stuff, You're like, these guys are insane. Yeah, oh, and yeah. Maybe, maybe, half, you can have the half a million dollars. Yeah. I'm not touching it. And maybe that's it. Maybe I just needed somebody who was the voice of of, uh, of the audience, you know, saying, "What are you doing? That's all like ski." That that could have been the reason. But but you said Pete London was based on something. That's what I was going to ask you. So what what was the story behind Pete London? Oh well, that's good. That's a good question. I wanted a a I always wanted a, a you know a criminal, a Godfather character to play. You know, in Daredevil, figuring at certain points he's going to encounter just the criminal element, right? And uh, and um, and I wanted somebody that could be the person we'd go back to. So it wasn't always this person, that person. I didn't want somebody who was totally evil, you know, somebody he could maybe deal with or or play off of in, in certain ways. And um, uh, Speed London was actually based on my grandfather, so who was <laughs> a little bit um, reputation in some ways there. And his uh, his his name is, is, was was Pete London in the sense that he, he had come down from the city of New London. Connecticut, and so while his name was not Pete London, he was known as Pete London because that's where he came from. So I had lifted him, you know, the name at least, and, and a little bit of the character, you know, from. Well, that's uh, how you know you're going to get the legal release. Just say, hey. Exactly. Nobody's gonna. Nobody's gonna. <laughs> nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna uh, play me off there. So, um, so that was a, a little bit of a nod to uh, to him. That's adorable. I love when writers do stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it's fun. It's fun to sort of like see the references and remind yourself, hey, that was that character. That's why I did that. That's that in joke. And yeah, you know, sometimes you can go too far down the in joke road, and then you're just laughing yourself. But now and again, it's a nice, nice nod to people. Yeah. So I mean, we'll get the more Pete London, but I think this was Pete London's last appearance because you know, after this, you know, Jack Batlin doesn't know Pete. Supposedly doesn't know. Pete right. Lundin. And we never got into that aspect of it. And I'm sure I would have brought it back in, and and there. And um, you know, probably had an incident of Batlin dealing with him in, in one way with the way Batlin was planning to deal with stuff. But after a point, there's a lot of things that you know didn't come back into play because they weren't my characters to play with. Yeah. Okay, so I I was never sure if it was just a big coincidence or if this was kind of like you know even like Pete you know you're saying goodbye to Pete London even. Oh, oh, like that! I knew that this was the last. Yeah, time. like you knew this was the last story, man. No, yeah. I didn't. No, I mean, I knew he wasn't going to play into Fall from Grace. There yeah, was barely, yeah. barely room for the characters we <laughs> we packed in there, and then um, an entry of knowledge wasn't going to really, you know, map out very well. Yeah. Um, there might have been an, an intention of one point or another to kind of bring him back um, into, um, you know, what was going to follow with. Uh, well, I, I always think of the next story as Mark of Cain because that was the original story, but it ends up becoming Wages of Sin. But um, uh, because that was getting a little bit more down into the into the street, but um, but by the time you know I mapped that whole story out and wrote that out, I was I, I was not having as much fun as I wanted to, so I probably wouldn't want one to play with as much. I, yeah, I, I was. I was just thinking. Of, I get, I wanted to see what you had still had still had in the uh, tank for story wise because I know I think last time we talked you said something about maybe even like a time travel story for Daredevil. It's funny, you know. You mentioned that. I mean, that was. Um, I mean, that I actually found the notes on, on that story the other day, or if because that was um, going to be called. I think you know because I've gotten to these all these biblical names. Um, <laughs> you know, and it was uh, somebody at one point had joked, um, uh, you know, I, 
Steven Seagal wants all his, his movie titles back because I was playing all these, like, <laughs> all these like three word you know titles like he was doing in the in the 90s and um, but um, but that story was going to be called I think Original Sin mm. and and Original Sin was going to to send Daredevil back in time to to 18 I, I can't remember the exact year it was, it was, I want to say 1890s New York. And 1890s New York was a completely different time. So the city was uh, most directly to me initially was the senses would have been completely different. So this, this character who knew New York like the cliche back of his hand, I know every scent and smell and taste and 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 such of this city and I can ping things you know from blocks away um, is going to be thrown into a city that is you know foul with types of pollution the rivers would have been soaked with blood from the, the slaughterhouses you know that were along the along the, the riverside um, uh, everything about it would have been different so what happens when a character who is completely dependent on his senses you know his oppression the overwhelming sense of these, he spent so much time becoming um, uh, disciplined about that in a way. He's thrown into an environment he's got no anger. So we were going to throw him back at that time, and then that time was also going to be about um, uh, that there was a, a, a real crime boss called Boss Wheat, who was a heavy set. <laughs> you know, um, you know, larger than the OG like, Kingpin, uh, if you will. <laughs> the OG Kingpin, exactly, and that would have been that's a very New York thing, yeah. Boss tweeds, even villain. New Yorkers today, yeah, yeah. That, 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 he's definitely, definitely that, and so he would have been the, become the main villain. Obviously, it would have been my version of him, so I would, I would have dialed him up, and then he probably would have had a a couple of hench people who would have been more. Um, super uh powered in some way i, w I don't think i was going to try to do the 1890s version of typhoid mary or the 1890s version of a bullseye or something but but he would have had something we would have created some new characters and then he would be trapped in this in this zone you know for these four or five issues of this mini series and and i i know that at some point in the time travel thing that we were thinking through he would have lost his costume so we would have to get another <laughs> get new new costume to uh, to play with, and uh, the 1890s version of it. And then, of course, I knew we was gonna get back in time, but I had no concept of how we were gonna get him back to modern day. <laughs> I figured I was I would figure that out as the, as we actually got into the story. But you know, we had an artist who was gonna be Paul Ryan, who was a, a really great guy and a, and a really great artist. He was signed up for it, and. Uh, and as I said the other day, I was looking through um, or something, and I came across um, not the notes for the story itself, because I lost a lot of my original materials on a, when I had a big, awful hard drive crash many years ago. So back up, everybody. Um, but it was the notes about 1890. You know, it was sort of like, this is what was happening in the city. These are industries that were going on in the city. This is what the neighborhoods were like. So I had all of Like the the little background stuff that we sprinkled throughout as we brought the the story to life. Not to be pushy, Dan, but you know Disney Plus needs content. I'm just saying, if you got any connections, I say, like Lily, if you know series, some like a a mini, an animated mini series. I'm just saying. I talk to your agent. I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, don't don't just say. <laughs> if I if I'm in there, I'd be all over that. Maybe I'll see what I can I can make happen. I, uh, I, I mean, uh, I mean, if you I would, would love to play there. I mean, historical fiction. Do, do you know you have like all like the historical fiction? Oh, oh the nerds would eat it up. <laughs> well, it's also like it's a perfect what if story, right? It's exactly. sort of you know even 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 if you didn't do, you know, even if you didn't do the whole time travel thing, if you just sort of said what if you know what if Daredevil existed eighteen hundreds, it's sort of like the one what if story I did, which you know you should include here. It's I'm gonna have fun with that one too. Would be the Right, the what if uh, Kingpin adopted Daredevil? Right, that was a that was a fun like story to do. So you know, within the what if world, uh, putting a character like Daredevil 
you know, in that zone, even without the time travel, be a lot of a lot of fun. I was gonna say, I mean, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to do an episode on yeah, that time travel story because I always think of you when it comes to Daredevils, like this street level stories, you know, even though Fall from Grace was like ninjas and mysticism and but yeah, I just it's just something different for you know when it comes to Daredevil, I'm just like, huh. But see, the thing with that is, it still felt grounded, even though it was n- yeah. <laughs> mysticism and ninjas, it still felt oh. kind of grounded. So that's the nice thing. Some, sometimes people go off the deep end with it. They get very iron well, with it, which is his point. But and this yeah. is this is from a woman named Lilith Hellfire. So if it sounds like grounded to you, it's like <laughs> preach. So um. <laughs> But no, but they, for Marvel. That that's where that comes from. <laughs> I'm I'm with it. I'm completely with it. But but you know, is but that's important, you know, for when and you know, some people can completely create in this in this out there space, right? And and all credit to them. But you, you know, you have to sort of follow what makes sense to you. And then if what if it makes sense to you, then hopefully uh, you know, the audience and readers get it too. So for me, I had to have logical points to the story where the bigger things, um, the bigger things, meaning, you know, the more out there stuff, you know, could, could connect back to. So even when you brought in a character like Ghost Rider, right, we talked about before, Ghost Rider's over here, Ghost Rider's way out in the, in the mystic, you know, fringes in his own world. And when you're playing in his world, if, Darede- if Daredevil showed up in a Ghost Rider story, right, he's the outsider. And so you can completely go into the, the weird results of the stuff. But Ghost Rider's visiting the Daredevil story, to me at least, it's got to stay more grounded because if it gets out of control and Ghost Rider brings in all the mystic evil forces and all this other stuff, then you're like, what's the... There's no point of reference, you know, for Daredevil or the reader or the writer for that matter, <laughs> at least to me. Uh, I'm just looking. We've got some questions here. Oh, Russell wanted to know: uh, Is it surreal seeing characters you wrote in comics on like the either either TV or the big screen? A little bit. I mean, you know, never, 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 especially after the Ben Affleck Affleck um, movie. Uh, you know, would you have expected? I'm sorry, did that the spit take moment where you were like, <laughs> um, you know, to see Daredevil played out in such a great way and i thought them i thought the series was, was terrific i mean i loved it and i especially love the you know the extended um you know moments those those three scenes you know the hallway scene the, the stairwell mm-hmm. scene the prison scene where it's just like he's going to town and that felt uh, you know so wonderful and um and uh and i just saw i don't i don't know if it's photoshopped or whatever but you know somebody sent around this like uh um uh, shot of uh, Charlie Cox and um, um, you know we, we actually play Spider Man. Um, oh, Tom Holland. Yeah, so it's Tom. It's Charlie Cox and Tom Holland in an office, and I don't know if it was photoshopped or not, but I'm 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 hoping, you know, it, uh, it manifested it, into existence. He said exactly <laughs> manifested into existence. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, it it it. I did feel, even though it was not Scott's costume at the end of the first season it's got a lot of elements to it the thing that's behind you right now and i remember like feeling like we took a lot of excuse me we took a lot of shit for the costume <laughs> in one point and and that felt like it's validation he just went to somebody he went to stilt man right he went you know and 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 asked for a rebuild of his costume that is more protected because of what he's going up against which is exactly the reason we did in Fall from Grace, and we took so much crap for that. So that felt like validation. And then, well, I didn't get one of those lovely little thank yous uh, in the credits. I mean, I know that I named the chase, right? Well, I gave the name to to Styx Group. Styx Group never had a name before. So, you know, when we started to kind of call them the chase uh, to kind of have a little bit of an identity to them, it was nice to hear that name drop in the in the series itself when they were they showed up and sticks or showed up um but just enjoying the character which which obviously i do i hope, hope that's obvious um you know it's fun to sort of see it 
now come to life. And people who probably had no idea of the character before because he's not up here. You know, he's or if they he's did a leveler. the movie. <laughs> yeah, or if they did, it's the movie, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like the one thing the movie got right, or not right, but I thought was interesting was, you know, he first, um, you know, he was just so beaten up. Yeah, I remember that. Yes. Like, it was like a shower scene or something. He's like just covered in like scars and he's got tooth loose. Or See, I told or you that was a great Phil and I have had this conversation. I will die on the hill. I don't think it's that bad of a movie. I felt that they got the essence. It was just the execution of it all. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's got it's in that weird zone between um like trying to trying to get somewhere but still being saddled with these TV movie trappings. And this kind of like, well, it's a comic book and it's a hero, so it's kind of silly, so we have to do these things. You know, the, the first movie that got everything right, in my mind, and I think probably for a lot of people, was Blade, right? That was like the movie that just, I remember going to see that and getting passed. It was just sometimes you get like passes, you know, because you were associated with Marvel and like we were like all rolling our eyes saying, what's, what's this going to be? Yes, Blade? Be They're doing Blade? Yeah, whatever. That kind of like, you know, and it was such a hardcore movie. You know, there was no, talk about no humor in a good way, right? It was just such a completely badass hardcore movie where everybody took everything seriously and, 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 just, and just hit every note. And it was, and that to me was like, the, then I think a lot of people would agree, that became like a model for following. And, and that's my case for passion projects because that was definitely a passion project for a lot of people. Was it? I didn't know the background on that, but it definitely shows. Yeah, Wesley Snipes really wanted to be Blade. <laughs> he really wanted yeah. to. So well, he, is he, he in the new one? He manifested it into existence. Yeah, he manifested in existence. Does he have a role in the new one? Has he been? Is he? I would hope so. I would hope he's. I, I hope they give him something to do, but like we haven't heard much. I, I'm, no. I'm interested in uh, Mahershala Ali's uh, portrayal, but like Blade, uh, Wesley Snipes is Blade to me. Always will be, but yeah, it's kind of yeah, yeah. like the John Wesley ship thing. That's always my flash because that's what I grew up with. <laughs> Sorry, Ezra. Sorry, Grant. <laughs> or the Ron. Yeah. I... Yeah. 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 Definitely seeing the, the TV show and uh, and um and you know you you hope you know the rumors of like will it come back to Disney Plus as one of these other ones that would be that would be awesome as well. Definitely. Yeah, Daredevil's that one. Like, I hope they bring back like that whole cast. You know. I thought the whole cast oh, was yeah. great. It's so you know, good. Augie Karen, it's even so uh, yeah, Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin. I mean, just just right down the line, so phenomenal. I mean, I remember laughing with my son, um, uh, you know, especially with some of the the scenes with Augie and uh, and uh, and Matt. It's like, man, you know, I don't actually know if I want Matt as my, <laughs> you know, he's he's got he's got the knowledge, but he's he's a little he's a little distracted. I want Foggy to find him. Not, not. <laughs> it's like Foggy's got his moment. Single handedly, no question. Foggy, Foggy holds it up, man. They're so, yeah. so true. I was gonna say that's like a very modern take, but I think even you did that in your run. It's like you know they used to like play Foggy as like you know the bumbling fool. Now it's like, like I said, even in your run, it's like, oh yeah, Foggy. No, Foggy's holding down the fort. Foggy's actually doing the nine to five work, you know, because Matt's out there all distracted. Exactly. Exactly. Like aspect of, of of that that you know I I, I I had to play out because you couldn't possibly have Matt over here you know keeping the business going and then you know it's just, it it becomes a good a character has to be a complete idiot to be that close to to somebody for the length of time that they've been together and not start to recognize some things you know I, I was you're jumping around issues here but you know the that moment where Foggy sort of Hands him his cane and says, You forgot your cane, you know, at one point when Matt's on his way out the door. And it's so, like, Yeah, you know, you know what he knows. And just because he's not saying it loud. And and Matt's arrogance also it's Matt's arrogance, right? Matt, Matt's got, got his own foibles, but, you know, his thinking, Well, I've got one over on everybody. I've got one over on this guy, my best friend. It's like, Maybe not so much. You, know, you, can't, you can't play it out over all that time and, and not let some things slip. That way. Well, I think I mean the play up in the one of the I, things you put into some of your issues. I think I mean you really can't have a lot of self doubts if you're the guy who's leaping backwards off of buildings every day. 
No, it can't. Right? That's old daredevil man without fear. But you know, but that also doesn't mean everything is as carefully planned out, right? You're taking a dare. You're taking a leap. You're taking. You're taking a. Um, uh, you know, you're charging into things. Um, you know, one of the things I realized after the fact, um, and I wish I'd played this out more in the earlier issues. Um, in some ways, but when I got to the last issue I wrote, to the last, last issue, which was the 380, right? You jump ahead and you get to the last thing, I think it was eight weeks. And uh, and there's a courtroom scene in there where I was sort of describing Matt's voice. And it was, you know, I remember writing the original version of that, sort of saying, you know, Matt's smart and he's got, you know, he's got the jury in his hands and, you know, he's, he, he's defending this guy. And then I ended up rewriting it and going with this, this guy just sounds dangerous, <laughs> you know, like to the jury, his voice, you know, he is not. Right. It gives him power because a risk, he's taking a chance. He's, he's, he's kind of the on edge character, even in that way, because I don't think ultimately, you know, there is that much of a facade between the two as there are between say Clark Kent, Superman, or even a Bruce Wayne, Batman, you know, identity thing. Um, you know, Murdoch is covered in scars and <laughs> bruises and, you know, and gets away with this. Oh, yeah, I'm blind. I, I ran into a doorway, you know, sort of thing. But, um, or but at the same time... Or he could have got mugged. He could have got mugged, yeah, exactly. But, but he's also sort of like, I'm, I'm not so concerned with this because i'm gonna i'm dare i'm daring you to call me out you know i'm daring you to 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 try to get my face about these things so um, i sort of realized that like after the fact a little bit more and might have gone back and, and played that out so i think i played that song but i could play it out. Hmm. all right so Lil, do you have any final questions? But should we let this man get on with his Saturday? Yes, let's let him get on with his Saturday because we could pick his brain all day. But we have so many more uh, end of the month. I hope so. That I'm looking this, forward to. This is this is me too. Me too. You guys have been great. This is I. I this is a great way to start my Saturday. Um, and I appreciate you guys uh, let me on. Can I plug my my newsletter? Absolutely. Is that okay if I do that? Well, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, please so, plug the newsletter because I, I saw you uh, were talking about uh, issue 380, which you were just talking about in there, which um, if you don't mind, next month, can we cover uh, Daredevil 380? That would be awesome. And we jump right, right. to the deep end. So um, uh, for folks who are interested, I've got a, a newsletter which talks about uh, comics and, uh, and modern day writing and, uh, and old stuff and often uh, touches on Daredevil. And uh, it, you can check out at Story Maze dot substack dot com and if you choose to subscribe uh which you do not have to to read some issues uh, but if you choose to subscribe you do get a free copy of uh the plot the original plot to daredevil 380 uh which is one of the few um uh, actual pieces of comic writing i have left uh after that awful hard drive crash so anybody who's listening wants to check that out that would be cool so, yeah, so if we're going to cover that next month, yeah, everyone sign up to uh, Dan's newsletter. You got to check out the script and you can follow along next month. Exactly. And then you could read the script and you could ask, why didn't that actually show up in the pages? Or <laughs> we can compare the, the plot to the actual uh, final comp. Oh, wait, uh, quick last minute question. Someone asked, uh, any advice for someone wanting, wanting to break in the comics? Do yeah. Go, go. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I would, I would, um, I mean, like any writing, read everything, read as much as you possibly can is the first thing. Do not just read the things you love. Look for the things that you might be surprising to you. If you're getting back into comic stores these days, uh, and, and, or if you can just, you know, see what's out there, uh, you know, pick some, some different things. So you can get some different rhythms. Reading is, is natural to, to writing. If that's the way you want to break in, there's different, I think, strategies of breaking in as an artist than breaking in as a writer. Um, but I would, um, I would say that that is most thing. And then on this, but you know, write, um, 
uh, you know, write uh, just from the things that you're really passionate about. Uh, you know, trying to kind of bend yourself into into weird shapes around. Well, I need to genre or this thing or this thing here doesn't uh, doesn't get you any place. Good. I think uh, reading is is the first part. I know I do it all the, all the time, even though I'm, I'm only working on one comic thing right now. Uh, for my own, my own sake, um, I will read stuff constantly to try to understand, you know, what's out there, how are people doing it, and it takes me in some really, really cool directions. So I'm going to start with that. One. But we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do a break into comics tip per episode. Oh, nice! Oh, nice, nice. And it, and again, yeah, next month, Daredevil 380. So yeah, go sign up for Dan's newsletter and. Uh, yeah, you could get the script for 380 and follow along. And I, I, I think that would be really, if anyone has any questions about breaking into comics, that would really be the one to, you know, because read the script and say, why did you do this? Or why, you know, why did you get this Please. direct? What's this? Please and get, get as deep in as, as that one, you know, into that one as possible. As a, and we, there's a lot of backstory around that that we can we can talk about as well. So that would be a fun one to get into. Okay. Uh but yeah, yes. Thank you. I mean, f not only for today, but for agreeing to do this uh, once a month. And uh, I mean, yeah. And, you, I mean, and we'll yeah. This is perfect. A lot of a lot of fun to even even know that we're going to be doing this. It's really energizing. So like maybe I mean I'll talk to you later. But I mean I guess maybe like a sat maybe a Saturday every month just doing this. A Saturday work probably. Yeah, that's that that this this type of time, and you know we'll just pick a date, and uh, and you guys you guys tell me, and we'll I'll lock it off. This is, this, but this generally work fine. Okay. So yeah, kids. I mean, yeah, and you can join us live every you know the Saturday mornings we do these. So bring your coffee. Get your coffee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See. All right, kids. So yeah. So uh, and if you have any questions, like we saw, you can uh, ask them live, or you can email us capes at lunatic gmail dot com or, or call text us apparently. I know. Well, the voicemail is six one four three eight two two seven three seven. That's six one four thirty eight capes. And yeah, again, you can also text. Which I couldn't even credit the person because there was no name. It was just the phone number. I don't think you want me giving out your phone number. Whoever sent that question. Yeah, just let so. like, at least throw your name in there. <laughs> And your answer was George. <laughs> uh, so yeah, fine. Just follow us on. We'll go to Linktree, l i n k t r dot e e slash Capes and Lunatics for links to all of our social media, links to this YouTube channel. Go subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can watch this video. You know, did you want to know what your favorite writer looks like? You could see him on YouTube once a month now. <laughs> I can't always promise a row cop shirt, but you know, we'll, we'll see what we can find. You know, I, I can't. I got to get a cool Daredevil hat. I've got my, I got my Daredevil pins and ties somewhere. I have to dig those out. So, I mean, if I, I mean, we'll get into some other Dare, stuff besides Daredevil too. Because, like, I think July. I think I wanted. Should we talk your uh, Punisher, Black Widow? Uh, oh, that would be fun. That would be fun. A lot of good things with that, and and uh, has one of the, some of the most fun things, and also. The worst moment of probably connecting, disconnecting with an artist in it. That was my one. There's a visual in there that never showed up that would have helped the story tremendously. But uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Then. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll do that in July for some reason. I don't know. We'll, we'll tie it into uh, isn't that isn't that when Black Widow's finally going to come out? Is it, oh is yeah. It it, that's all about the synergy. Yeah. Exactly. The algorithm, you see. Exactly. <laughs> That should be the final day because they're doing that, you know, in theaters and on Disney Plus at the same time. So, yeah, that should be the final day. Ah, pandemics. Fingers crossed that we're actually back to normal. I want to see that in the movie. Uh, I don't care. I just want to see it. All right, kids. So, yes, you got your homework. Come back next time. Dan will be back in a month. So, setting your questions. Go subscribe to his newsletter. Get the script. All the behind the scenes stuff. And again, once again, thank you, Dan, for uh, Thank you. Yes, Phil, Lilith, thanks again, guys. This is terrific. And, um, we will see each other in a month, and I'm sure we'll be trading some notes behind the scenes before then. Oh, yeah. All right. Good deal. Send your questions. See you later. Thank you, sir. Okay, take it easy. Bye.
That went great. I love. That was fun. I love the Russell got into the mix. Such a great guest. Really great dad. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm once glad you roped him in. Once a month, kids, come back. Because remember, the devil you know. Better than the devil you don't. And we know.